Queens and from Wisconsin and Kentucky and New York and everywhere. So very excited to see you. Um, what I what I want to do is I want to get started and just mention to you as uh, Bianca had typed in, this is uh, our fourth in a five-part series about sewing machines and just giving tips and hints. My name is Sonny Grint, and I know some of you, I hope of, I think some of you have come back from uh, our last sessions. And if you do want to watch those other sessions, the first one was more about, um, you know, terms and just the basics of things. The second one was about stitch length and width and tension Last week, we started into what, what do you do with a straight stitch and a zigzag? So those all, all of those sessions, they are recorded and uh, you can get those. Amy has put those links up for you. Um, so please take a look at those if you have not seen those yet. So anyway, today I'm really excited. We're going to really get into a little more, um, I say, advanced sewing techniques in that we're going to work on buttonholes. Okay, so we're going to work on buttonholes and what you can do to uh, make your buttonholes look a little bit either nicer or if you've never done a buttonhole, what you need to do for that. Um, the second thing we're going to do last week, we talked about using a zigzag as an overcast. I want to show you what a multiple zigzag is. So we're going to see a, a different reason to use a multiple zigzag. And then um, the third thing we're going to do is a blind hem. And so uh, we're going to work on that. In the write up, it said a little bit about um, stretch stitches. And guys, if we don't get to stretch stitches today, uh, we will do that next week because I've been kind of doing the sum of the stuff that we were going to do next week, this week. Um, I'm going to try and get there, but I cannot guarantee it just because, oh my gosh, we always have such good questions and things. So that's kind of what we're doing here. Um, we have Bianca is helping us. She is um, the switcher. She's going back and forth for cameras. And I'm so happy to have both Vanessa and Amy are here again to answer your chats. So have questions, go in the chat. So I think we're ready. I'm very, you know, I, you can tell I love I love to sew, it's so fun. Um, really enjoy this, so uh, glad you all are here. So let's go ahead. We're gonna get started with buttonholes, everyone. And I always feel, you know, buttonholes can kind of scare people. The main reason why I think I kind of get like, oh my gosh, it's a buttonhole is um, it's the last thing you do, right? You have the whole garment, figured out and it's the last thing you do. So it can make or break it at that time. So I'm gonna give you a couple of hints, tips on what to do with buttonholes. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Before I start with the machines though, I do want to show a couple samples for you. And um, both of the samples I'm gonna show, they ha do have a little bit of machine embroidery on them. That's not why I'm really showing you them why I'm showing you is buttons. I want you, next time you go in, don't, I want you to look for cool buttons because the buttons can make a garment and then the buttonhole obviously is important for that. I wanna share with you, oh, it's a little dark, but hopefully you can see and I'll zoom way in. Can you see those buttons? See how they've got that triangle button? That This little jacket, I took the triangle to a whole new, uh, point in that, huh, no pun intended, triangle point. Sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> but basically, I went ahead and I did a little uh, pocket, a little, basically, it's like a bound pocket that was a triangle to go with my triangle buttonholes or my triangle buttons. So the button can really make or break a garment. I think that's a cool one. And then this one, uh, this is just another a little jacket that I did again. Oh, it's I, I guess I have dark jackets, so pardon me for that. But what I want to do is I, I can get up here so you can see my button. I may have to do a different uh, uh, camera for this, so I'll get a different camera for this. 
But this button here, it's like a burgundy color and that's what I did my embroidery with. And it also has some design on it. So I'll use a different camera. I think you'll be able to see here in just a minute. So think about your buttons and then we're gonna make the buttonholes for it, right? So I just wanted to show you because buttons are so cool. So make sure, you know, when you're looking, think about how you can really dress up a garment, a jacket, a shirt or whatever with the buttons themselves, all right? So here we go. I am going to, yeah, I'm gonna have us go to the other camera. And when you start looking at, there we go. Uh, when you start looking for button holes on your machine, okay, so button holes on your machine, what you want to look for is you want to look for a picture like this. This right here is my button hole for this particular for our heavy duty. And then also you want to find, see how there's a little picture up here. So see how I've got that picture up here? That is also of a buttonhole. These are two very important things, right, for your buttonholes. So you are um, working with that. I do wanna share with you, when you see a picture like this, in most cases, everyone, in most cases, this means it is a one-step buttonhole. And I'll, I'll explain what that means. We're gonna do that here just in just a moment. We're gonna do a one-step buttonhole, but I want you to realize, again, this is what you're looking for on your machine. Now, depending upon your machine, okay? So depending upon your machine, it may be a little bit different. Your buttonhole foot may look different than what I'm going to show you today. So please get your manual out. This is where I'm gonna give you those tips and hints on how to set up for a good buttonhole, but guys, you're going to have to really figure this out on your particular machine. And I know that's a little tricky sometimes, but really that's, we can, I can show you, I'll give you those tips and hints, but definitely you wanna look for something that looks like a buttonhole like that, all right? And now, uh, so from a one-step buttonhole picture like this, I'm gonna move over, I'm actually gonna start with a different machine today. And I know it might be a little tricky to see, but can you all look right in here? And let me see if I can even get a little bit closer for you. There we go, just a little bit closer. See how there's a little pictures of a buttonhole and there's a number one, two, three, and four. This is, all right, so this is what is called a four-step buttonhole. So each time I do another section, I will actually be, um, I, I will actually be changing a dial for each section like that. And what I mean by changing a dial, if I come over here and get myself here, you can also see a number one, two, three, and four. So that's on that dial and everyone, when it, when it looks like that, this is called a four step buttonhole. So I've got my picture of my one, two, three, four here. And then I've got a little picture of a buttonhole at this point. And that's where you, again, all of these pieces are gonna work together. And what I, again, suggest to you wholeheartedly is you get your, your manual out, you're gonna to have to probably take a little look and see what's going on with the manual. But basically you wanna make sure that, you know, you're looking for something that looks like a buttonhole like that on your machine, okay? So the next thing we wanna look at is we are gonna look at our buttonhole foot. Now this is our buttonhole foot for a four-step buttonhole. And what happens is this little piece here, can you see how that slides? And that is actually what's gonna move my fabric around a little bit. So this foot, it will, uh, will help you and help you move that around just a little bit with your button, buttonhole, excuse me. And then once you have your button, what these little guides do on the side is you're just gonna put your button up to the guides and measure 
Okay, so if I'm holding that, I can see I've got a notch here and a notch down here that I'm going to make my buttonhole that size. Okay, so you want to make your buttonhole just ever so slightly larger than your button because you want to be able to like, if you've ever tried to put a um, button through a buttonhole that it doesn't uh, work very well it's because it's probably too small. So make sure you make your buttonhole just slightly larger than your button, okay? So we've got our buttonhole foot. We know the size because we measured it right here. The other thing you want to make sure you're aware of is right here, again, this little dial, and most machines have something similar to this if you're working with a mechanical model like this, is the closer you are to one, the further away your stitches are in your buttonhole. The closer you, closer you are to zero, the more satiny your buttonhole is going to be. So it really depends on you and your personal feeling what that's going to be. Okay, so again, buttonhole closer to zero, it's going to be your stitches are closer together, closer to one, your stitches are farther apart. All right, and last but not least, let's get our fabric set up. All right. When you are working with buttonholes, and I wrote all over this, I know that uh, you would never do this, but when you are working on buttonholes, the placket, the front of your garment, you really want to use some sort of, um, I say stabilizer, this really is interfacing, okay? It's a little different than stabilizer. It is going to stay in the garment. So this is an interfacing you wanna use. And that's gonna help your buttonholes look really nice. So make sure you have a little bit of interfacing. Usually a pattern will tell you that. But the other thing I also like to do is I use a tear away stabilizer. So I really do use both. I use the interfacing. That is what's called for in my garment. And then a little bit of tear away. And I'm just gonna set that behind because that's gonna make my stitching look very pretty. So Vanessa and Amy, have there been any questions so far? We're doing okay? Good. All right, everyone, I know it's a little tricky with uh, everyone having different machines, but hopefully this will give you some, just some good ideas. That's, that's our point for this. Um, what I didn't say, and I know a lot of you are taking notes, we set up our machine with the one, two, three, four, and our stitch length, but guys, this also is something that's kind of a pro tip. I call it a pro tip. When you are working with a buttonhole, it's kind of like a satin stitch. This is my tension dial. If you want a prettier buttonhole, take your tension a little bit less. So I'm taking my tension from four to three. So smaller number, less tension. What that does is it makes the top of your buttonhole look prettier. So again, if you're writing something down, that's a really great tip is to take your top tension a little bit lower and you're gonna get a prettier buttonhole. All right. So if you remember kind of back from toward the beginning of our lessons, we are going to take off our presser foot. There's usually a little button in the back or they slide off the front. It depends on your machine. Mine happens to have a little button in the back. I'm gonna drop that presser foot off. And then I know it can be a little bit tricky. This foot can look forward or backward. What is it? Um, Really, what you have to see is there's got to be an opening for where your needle is going to go into it. So this is going to be, the foot is going to slide forward like that, okay? So let's go ahead and put on our buttonhole foot. And I'm just going to snap that in. Something else that I really want you all to see is I'm gonna take my top thread. Here's my top thread. I'm gonna place that underneath 
through that hole in my presser foot. Easier said than done when I'm on camera like that. And I'm just gonna pull that to the back because that's gonna make a nicer buttonhole. So I marked my buttonhole size. This is gonna be the start of my buttonhole and this is gonna be the end, all right? So, and when I'm talking about the hole, this whole big slot here is where I want to put my, uh, put my threads through that, depending upon your, your button, uh, basically your buttonhole foot. This is another one. It would be the slot like you would see in your uh, regular sewing machine foot. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're putting the threads to the back of your um, presser foot, just like we normally do, all right? So I went ahead and I've marked, this is the line that all of my buttonholes are going to go on. And then here is how big I'm going to make my buttonhole. I'm gonna slide that underneath. And when I put my presser foot down, Okay, when I put my presser foot down, I've lined to the back to the front. So I've got that lined up right in the middle. Okay, and let's go ahead and come back here, everybody, because I'm on dial number one and I've got my buttonhole size and length to how close the stitches are. Just kind of a little bit closer to zero because I like a more satin stitch buttonhole, a closer together buttonhole. All right. And then, make sure I have that so you all can see. And I'm gonna go ahead and start. And I did not say this everyone, but I'm going to. You wanna practice your buttonhole before you put it on your garment. I know that seems very intuitive, but there've been times I'm like, oh, I'm just in a hurry. Never quite goes right. So I'm just taking my satin stitch a little bit closer together. And I'm going to sew forward until I get to that other line. Okay, so until I get to the other line. And then everybody, sorry for my fingers in the way, I'm going to go to number two. And number two is the basically the bar tack at the end. I'm gonna take a few stitches. I'm now gonna go to number three. See why this is called a four step. I do one, I stitch two, and I bar tack about three or four times. And now number three, I'm going to go back to the other side. And everyone with a four step buttonhole like this, you have to stop at each step. If I would have kept my foot on the foot control, the machine just would have kept sewing and sewing and sewing. So you're going to stop at each step. I'm going to go to number four. And everyone, there's my little buttonhole. I think I, I actually grew up with my mom having that big buttonhole attachment. I think this is just fabulous to be able to do this in four steps like this. Now I'm gonna bring this up really close, maybe. You can kind of see up here, that's where I adjusted. I brought my, my stitch closer together, more toward the zero versus where I got it to be with a satin stitch. And that's, everyone, that is where it just takes practice. So you wanna practice your buttonhole, practice your buttonhole again, just like you would on your garment. So having the interfacing, and having the stabilizer behind. It's um, beautiful, yeah. perfect. It is, you know, it just takes practice, but this is so great. So again, what I'll, 
what I'll basically tell you again is taking the tension to a lower number, make sure you do that because that really is something that you're gonna do that, uh, that will make your buttonholes look nicer. The other thing is again, one, two, three, four, stop when, stop between each session. And I see a couple people that are saying about cutting your buttonhole, you definitely, you know, now you've made, you know, a pretty buttonhole, right? Now, what do you want to do? How do you cut it? There are tools out there. Um, super sharp pair of scissors works well, but I'm going to give you a little tip that I think is super important no matter what tool you use, is to take a pin, a P-I-N pin, and what you want to do is you want to put that pin right before, so I actually put it right before the end of my buttonhole. And then I'm gonna do the same thing down here. Because so I'm gonna take a pen and I'm gonna do that right before the end of my buttonhole. Because whether you have a scissors, if you get to that end, you're gonna end up cutting, trying to cut the pin, which is not good for your scissors, but also it's great for the buttonhole because you can't go through the end. Some people use their, um, their seam ripper. Some people actually call it a button, buttonhole knife, whatever you want to call it, your unsewer. Um, if you use this, do be very careful. But again, you come up, sorry, my hand was in the way. I just put it through. You come up to the end. You can't go any further than that pin. So that's that. Once someone told me, I certainly didn't come up with that tip. Once someone told me that tip, I was like, woohoo, that uh, makes it so much better. And you're just going to go, and I'm kind of in a bad position here, guys. So pardon me for that. Really hard to see, but just takes you right to that end. And that's what opens your buttonhole. So again, put those pins in the end, like in the end, so you can't go cut through your buttonhole all the way. Can you talk through okay. what direction um, in your four-step buttonhole each number is sure. going? Sure. So the question that Vanessa just asked, all right, is about the, and I might be able, you might be able to see it over here a little bit more. With my four-step buttonhole, you're going to notice the one, two, three, four. One came from the top and worked its way down. Two is at the bottom, okay, so the bottom. Three works its way back up, and four is at the top. Guys, what you're noticing here, that one, two, three, four, once you see where two and four are on your picture, you know the direction that those other sides are going to go in. I've actually seen some machines that go backwards, then the top, and then down, and then the bottom but it all depends on where one is. Look for where two and four are. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense because that is really, so again, it comes down, end, up, end. And uh, I saw someone say, yay, they, they did it. So that is so great. Okay. I'm so glad to hear that you're doing the buttonholes. Tell them we're gonna do the one step. Now. And now, okay, yeah. So Vanessa, just a reminder. So this was the four step buttonhole. I'm already prepped down here for our one step. So we're gonna do the one step next, all right? So I'm gonna change machines for us and get my camera, all right? So get my camera, excuse me, right down here. So you can see this a little bit. Again, with our one step buttonhole, there is no one, two, three, four. The machine actually does that for you. So basically we want to set this, your dial with the one button picture of the buttonhole. Take your tinch, your, um, excuse me, your stitch link. Okay, so this is your stitch link. Again, it depends on how close you want your um, satin stitching to be. Okay, so it depends on how close you want your satin stitching to be for that. So we'll probably have to do a little bit of a test again for that. And the last thing is on this particular model, I do need 
to change my width, all right? So I do need to change my width and I'm taking that all the way up to six, okay? So as wide as this will go. With my tension, same tip everyone, take it to a lower number. It's gonna be a prettier buttonhole, prettier satin stitch if you have your tension a little bit lower. All right. So now this is, everyone, a little bit different. And what's different is the buttonhole foot, okay? So the buttonhole foot is what's going to give me the size depending upon my button. So pardon me here. For most machines, what you're gonna see, if you have a one-step buttonhole, your foot should, will look similar to this. It may not look exactly like this, but it will look similar to this. And in the very back, and don't think I can even, if there's a little picture of the button, of a button on the very back of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this up and actually place my button and push that down. And my button now is in the back of my foot. And I've got a little area right in here. And what this area is, is that's how big my button hole is going to be because I've got my button in it. Notice I'm trying to be very careful to say button in the right time and button hole in the right time. So let's go ahead and take this presser foot off. All right. And with that, we're going to replace our button foot. So I'm just going to go ahead and snap this down. So that's right there. Okay, so that's right there. And then I still like to, in this case, I don't have a really big area. So I am actually putting my, need, my th needle thread through the very front hole of the button hole foot. Okay, so right, right in there. All right. Now it's I know it's a little trick to see. Now with the one step buttonhole, what I want to do is I want to share with you one other thing. So I'm going to actually take my camera way down, a lot lower. Because some of you, I know last time we were asking about, you know, here is your needle threader, we were talking about a needle threader. Some of you had another little, it's actually a little lever that has a picture of a buttonhole on it. You definitely need to bring this down. And the other thing you need to do is push it back. That's what engages a one-step buttonhole. So you bring this lever down, and then it even says on this guy, it says push. So when you get it all the way down, you're gonna push it back, okay? So you're gonna push it back. So pull your, the lever down, push it back. I'm just gonna use the same piece of fabric that has the, um, the interfacing as well as that little bit of stabilizer behind. This time, everyone, again, I really recommend you practice because this time the buttonhole is gonna go in reverse. So it's gonna go backwards first for this, okay? So I've got my, my lever down, my buttonhole lever down, pushed back, and now I'm gonna step on my foot control. Once it gets to the end, it actually hits that lever, pushes, and now it comes back forward. And I may have to do this again because I don't know if you actually were able to see that on the camera. Okay. But once it's done, again, I can find my scissors there for a moment. Again, just again, a really nice little buttonhole. And again, starting, it went backwards, bar tack, forward, and bar tack. So this one, it does go a little bit in a little different direction again, but it's automatically done for you because it is that one step. 
So if you ever, when you're practicing, okay, so if you're ever practicing and you're like, eh, I don't like that, and you stop in the middle of a one-step buttonhole, I'm going to give you a little tip, is go back to your dial and just turn it again and turn it back because that'll get everything set into place, okay? So it'll get everything set into place. Um, but again, with the one-step buttonhole, very important, pull down the buttonhole lever, pull it down straight, okay? And then push it back. If you don't do, if you don't push it back, it's not going to engage the buttonhole. So do I need to do that again, you think? Or are we pretty good, guys, on that? It's, it is, it's very straightforward. It's all about this guy. And also, again, remember on both of these buttonholes, I went ahead and I took my tension to a smaller number. It'll just make your buttonhole a lot prettier and definitely a, a stabilizer on the back. And I saw someone said again, please. So Sorry, what model is your heavy duty machine? So it is the 4452. So it is the 4452, all right? And it is the Singer Heavy Duty. So, all right. So again, to measure for this particular style of buttonhole, remember the button actually, simply it goes in the back of the foot and that automatically makes it the proper size. So that is how you measure for this type of buttonhole. And I'm not making this little, putting this foot on look easy, am I? So there's that. And I'm going to pull this to the back. Again, pulling this down, pushing back. So make sure I'm pushing back. And I'm just going to kind of do this in the middle this time. So do this kind of in the middle. All right. Going backwards first, bar tacking, coming back forward. There we go. And there it is again, same size, just different place. So making it pretty easy. And again, don't forget the tip with your when you're ready to cut the button or cut the um, slot in your buttonhole, make sure to, uh, you know, have a little, have your pins in there so you don't uh, cut the end. Okay. All right. Hey, somebody asked, how do you make uh, big buttons or giant buttons? So for giant buttons, that's a little bit different for our um, machines with these buttonholes, right? So with these style of buttonhole feet. So you actually would not end up using this. You would use your regular sewing foot and you would just have to be a little bit aware and careful of where things go. So if you're using a one-step buttonhole, Remember, I said when you push it back, whenever it hits at the end, um, that's when it turns around and comes back forward for a one-step buttonhole. So what you'd have to watch is when you get to the end of your super big buttonhole, you would just push it forward, and that would engage it to come back the other way. Okay, so that would be the way on this guy, is you just have to watch and make sure you personally engage it to bring it back the other way. And then on the four-step buttonhole, again, you're gonna use the same, same foot. So you're gonna use this, you know, the same regular sewing foot, but then you would do kind of do the same thing. You'd just be looking, where do you turn your dial one, two, three, four? So it takes a, that, I, that guys, I will tell you, it takes a little bit more practice for that. So please, uh, um, practice those larger buttonholes, but they certainly can be done with that. All right? All right. So I think I'm going to um, go ahead and I'm just gonna move this just a little bit. 
And I'm going to place my one machine out of the way so I can have a little bit more space to, to sew as I'm going forward here. And what we're going to do next, so any other buttonhole questions, Vanessa and Amy? about is the needle down or up? I, so for these particular uh, machines, the needle does not stop either up or down. It's not a, it's a more random. So you always wanna make sure when you start sewing, no matter what, that the needle is in the highest position as well as your, sorry, my hand in the way, as well as your take up lever should be in the highest position. That will make sure that when you are, um, oh, I bet you I know what her question was. Anyway, that'll make sure you don't lose your threads at the beginning. I bet I know if you are doing a four step buttonhole. So if we come back real quick, Bianca, to our other camera on the four step buttonhole, I'm just gonna reach across here for that. So over here, when you are stopped and you're like changing between step one, two, three, and four, please, and I meant to say this, please make sure your needle is up, okay? Make sure your needle is up. So when you're changing from one, two, three, and four over here, make sure your needle's up because that is what, uh, if the needle's down, it can pull your needle and bend the needle. So I think that maybe was what you were asking. So please make sure your needle is up when you're doing the four step buttonhole and you change steps, okay? Anything else before we leave buttonholes? I know this, Guys, we do the decorative stitch for the buttonhole. So the question was, can you use a decorative stitch for the buttonhole? And the answer is no. The buttonholes are made with this particular stitch. There are some machines that are a little bit more higher specified that maybe have some different styles of buttonholes. But for our um, Singer machines that we're doing these one and four step buttonholes, they are using the satin stitch only. So. All right, so our next thing that we're going to work with, our next stitch, so one of those other stitches that are on your machine that you're maybe like, what do I do with this, is it's called a multiple or three-step or multi-step zigzag, and there are different names for it. Most machines have this, and so, Bianca, we're going to go back to our other camera, and... Then I'm going to come down just a little bit so we can look at the stitches that we have. Now, everyone, your machine may look a little different than this because it may have a few different stitches. It may have similar stitches. It may not have the colors it may. But what I want you to look for is I want you to look for, remember last week we used the straight stitch and the zigzag stitch. Okay, so straight and zigzag. There is a stitch that looks kind of like a zigzag, but it's got dashed lines. And this is your multi zigzag stitch. Okay, so this is your multi zigzag stitch. And what that really is doing is every time it goes to one side with a zig, it also takes two straight stitches. And then it comes back with the zag, it takes two more straight stitches. Where we use this stitch, so where we use this stitch is really when we're doing mending, or I don't know if you remember everyone last week. And if you didn't see the class last week, again, you can look it up and see that, but we use just a regular zigzag to finish our edges from last week. What can happen if you use too wide of a stitch for this is it can actually cause your fabric to pucker. We call it tunneling and it actually makes a little tunnel. The multi zigzag will stop tunneling. So what I want you to watch and let's see how close I can get for you guys with this. So I'm going to come down. This is actually a really great stitch because I'm going to have my width 
as wide as it will go. So I've got my width to five or six or four, whatever you have, as wide as it'll go. And my stitch length about a one. And what I want you to see and kind of watch if I can see how the needle is going up and down a lot of different times when it's going back and forth. And I'm trying to go a little bit slower. And now I'm just going to go back to a zigzag stitch same width and watch again. See how it's not, the needle isn't going this as quickly. Why I wanted to share that with you is the, this part over here, that's your multiple zigzag stitch and see how there are a couple little uh, straight stitches with every zig. That is a super wide zigzag stitch. See, that's what's called tunneling. So I was very careful last week to not use a super wide zigzag so it wouldn't tunnel for my finishing. But honestly, everyone, this is my favorite type of stitch to do for um, overcasting or for basically finishing the edge for this. And again, it's the multi zigzag and it's taking a couple straight stitches for every zigzag stitch. And the width was six. So again, as long, excuse me, as wide as it will go um, for your machine. So as wide as it will go, it is set at six. The length, everyone, mine is set at two, but I think it's a personal preference how close you want this together. I wouldn't put it super close together meaning I wouldn't take it down to one because that's gonna take you more into the mending realm. But in this case, uh, for finishing an edge, that is a great stitch. And did you adjust your tension at all? Oh, no, I didn't actually. I did not adjust my tension. So basically you should keep your tension at normal, meaning four, five, most of our machines four is normal, but around four, Depending upon your fabric, of course, you may have to adjust it slightly, but you want a normal tension for that. Okay, so that is your multiple zigzag stitch. Most, uh, almost all machines to take today, not everyone, but all of them have um, a little piece that comes off that exposes this great free arm here. Why I wanted to expose that and show you really fast, I'm gonna show you really fast, is I have an old pair of jeans that I have a rip in. And this is where that uh, really, really wonderful open arm comes into play. Because what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take now, if I was really doing this, everyone, so if I was really doing this, I would have the same color of thread in top and bottom and it would match my, my fabric, right? It would match my fabric. The other thing I wanna make sure I do is when I'm doing something like mending, I always keep an old pair of jeans around and handy. One that, you know, either I've, I've either, we don't wanna admit this, but either I've grown out of, or I just, you, you know, they're all messed up. And I keep a little piece so that what I can do is I can actually put that underneath my uh, where my hole is, right? So where I'm gonna do my mending. So I always like to, when I'm mending, have that little extra piece underneath. And let's get this back up in here. And so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna lower my presser foot and why I'm doing this is I am using that multiple zigzag stitch again, that same multiple zigzag stitch, this time taking it super close together. And I'm just going right over the top of that tear. And you may end up at this point want to use a reverse. Yeah. 
depending upon how, how bad that tear is. Coming back forward. And everyone, if you use this particular stitch with the proper color of thread, that is like the best mending stitch ever. <laughs> I think it's really great. The stitch width, again, as wide as it would be for something like this, at least if you've got a super big tear, your stitch length closer together toward between, actually, I've got mine at a half. Actually, I've got it at about half. But go over it a few times. I have remade a whole pair of uh, knees on my jeans before by with using this stitch. Something else that's kind of fun for kids though is use a bright color and kids love this because it really is cute on their uh, jeans or clothes. So um, try different things when you're using mending on that. So mending is a great thing with that multiple zigzag stitch. All right. So besides the overcasting. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what did she say? I couldn't you better read. not mend the team's jeans because they like the hole. You know? <laughs> someone made a lot of money. For yeah, those holes. <laughs> someone wrote in the, the team's jeans don't get to those because uh, they paid a lot of money. But that's great. That's that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. So everyone, um, we have one more thing to work on, and uh, I I have to say we're all smiling here. Uh, the uh, the I I can't I the kids kids that have those holes I'm like oh my gosh my mom would have never let me out of there but I guess that just is our age right I see someone saying how's it look on the back of this so if I go ahead and turn that inside out everyone I would have been a little bit more careful honestly with my with my back piece. I would have pinned that so I, it kind of went over the edge. But basically, what you want to do is you want to come in and you want to, you can trim it close. Okay, so you ju you're just going to trim this up close. You probably, like I said, I should have uh, been a little bit more careful and uh, it was close, but you can just trim that up nice and close. And that way, again, it's going to be stronger if you put that fabric over the top. Okay, it's going to be a, or an underneath, not over the top, uh, if you put that underneath, because that'll just make it uh, a lot stronger for you. <laughs> and it won't come undone. <laughs> and I'm laughing because that's what the kids would want, right? Is it all to come undone? All right. So the last thing we're going to work with here, everybody, is what is called a blind hem. And a blind hem, uh, Bianca, let's come back real quick again to our, our other camera, because with a blind hem, I do want to let you all know that um, we are, uh, we're, we're not actually, uh, blind hems take practice, everybody. Blind hems take practice. And so what I'll say is uh, you may have to practice this more. There we go. We, have to, we may have to practice this more than what you uh, would want to. And the other thing is, depending on your fabric, your thread, what's going on with the blind hem, you really, again, it's something that you uh, want to try on your fabric. Again, this is a, a little dress that I made a while ago, but I want to share with you at the very bottom of this. This is actually a blind hem. And what I did is underneath. Now, we're gonna talk about, I know a couple of you have asked about sergers before. And so I'll talk about that next week, but I used a surged edge, but the hem itself is a normal blind hem on my machine. And I, guys, I know it's impossible to see. That's why it's blind. You're not supposed to have to see this. So um, what I'll do is let's go ahead and we're gonna come back to our machine. So now we're, I'm going to go ahead and flip back over Bianca if we can. And the trick, this is what a blind hem stitch looks like. 
Okay, so this is what a blind hem stitch looks like. It has a couple straight stitches and then one zigzag, and a couple straight and one zigzag. And basically, the zigzag piece is what hooks into the hem. And if you do it right, makes it blind, makes it so you can't really see what's going on. All right. So, what you want to do when you are prepping your garment or your fabric for a blind hem. If this is the front of my garment, notice I use that multiple zigzag stitch to finish off the bottom of the edge. Okay, so finish off the bottom of the edge with that multi zigzag stitch. And then what you're going to do is you're going to fold up and press your hem. So I know that kind of looks funny, but this is again, I'm just folding up the hem and I'm going to press that. Folding up the hem and I'm going to press it. So now this is basically ready, ready to go. All right. And I'm going to come back and show you settings here in just a moment. Okay. So I'm going to show you settings. I just wanted you to see what the blind hem looked like first. So now that I have this, the trick with the blind hem is all about the fold. And so what you're going to do is you're going to fold your, your garment or whatever it is so that you see your overcasting. So here it is. I see my overcasting. And that zigzag is going to jump into this folded area. Okay. And I'm going to show you, and then we'll show you again. But this does take a little bit of practice and remembering. And I will tell you, once I figured out the blind hem, I cut off, I practiced on something like this. I cut off this piece of fabric and I kept it so I could remember how to do a blind hem each time. Okay. So here is, again, I've got my fabric. It's finished, I fold up the hem, and then I'm gonna fold it back so I see this. All right, so that, that, that was maybe too early. So let's come back here. The blind hem, so this was your, someone, I took this away pretty quickly. You wanna look for a stitch that looks like this on your machine. Depending upon your machine, so mine, Okay, so mine, it's right there, looks like that. Depending upon your machine, you may see one that's going the other way. That's not what you want. You want it so that, that the big zigzag is going to the left. That's really important. The big zigzag is going to the left. Okay, so you want it to look like this. Now, you'll notice on my little sample here, I have my width set at six, length at two, the width at six, length at three. See how it's a, those little zigzags are a little bit farther apart, okay? I'm gonna show you another sample, is that the width here I have set at 4.5, and here the width is set at three. So it's just how big that zig is going to be. I will tell you that the more you practice and the better you get at blind hymns, a lot of people want to take their width a little bit closer, a little bit smaller, so it's not quite as big. When you're practicing, I would say at least have your width at 4.5 and then your length at about 2.5 or 3. But this is what I use when I'm practicing and, and figuring things out is my width is at 4.5. And my length is at 2.5. So width at 4.5, length at 2.5. And you guys are anticipating me. I hear someone say, asking about which foot do you use? It depends a little bit on your machine, what machine you have and what machine you can get. There are blind, if at all possible, use what's called a blind hem foot. This is going to give us a great way to 
um, adjust your uh, fabric to make sure you're going in the right direction. It gives you a little bit of a guide as you go, as you go along. So a blind hem foot is great. If you don't have a blind hem foot, I will say it's gonna take even more practice. But the other thing is, is you will use your regular sewing foot. Okay, so your regular sewing foot for your blind hem, okay. So guys, let us now see if I can go just a little bit higher for you as far as the camera goes. Right there. And what I'll do is I'm going to just sew. And again, I chose, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say this again. I chose my width at 4.5 and my length at 2.5. Okay. And now every little bit, your, your needle is gonna go from the left to the right. And then you're just going to practice. You notice how I'm not talking while I'm doing this because I'm concentrating really hard. So here is, see how that zigzag stitch has hooked into right here. It's hooked into that fold. If I was using now, if I was using a pink rather than a bright pink thread, look at how nice and even that is, holds it nice and flat. And then you just press it on this side. You can see that. And I just wanna share with you using the same settings, okay, using the same settings, I. With that um, stitch, when I have a fabric that you can't, look at that, you can't even, barely even see that blind hem if you use the right color of thread on the proper fabric. So again, the fold, everyone, I know that's always the trick. So I've got the here, I've got my, my hem folded up, fold it back, and you're gonna stitch and catch into this little fold. But just practice, 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 all right? Practice, 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 all right? And the foot itself, it is a blind hem foot, okay? So it is a blind hem foot for this. All right, everyone? Now, my time, my time always goes so quickly. If we come back, Bianca, to the other screen, And I just, I wanna thank you all for coming. I hope you learned a tip or two here and there and to make your sewing, uh, you know, sewing easier, sewing better, you know, just some things that maybe you, you do and you don't even know you do, right? But next week, okay, so next week, that's our last time for this, all right? So um, next week we are going to work on stretch stitches. I'm going to give you a little bit of tips on decorative stitches. And also, I want to introduce you to a serger. We're not going to do a serger class, everyone. So don't come here and say, oh, gosh, it was supposed to be. No, I just want to introduce you to it. Because some of you who are doing lots and lots of sewing may find a serger um, helpful. And um, so we just want to show you what it does. And so anyway. Guys, thank you very much. I hope you, I thank you. I see someone clapping and hopefully uh, you are uh, learning as we go. So we'll see you next week and have a great rest of your day, wherever you are. Bye all.